Christianity, I hope to argue, is political mm-hmm. by its very nature. Mm, that's good. And that religion is an invention of 15th century Enlightenment political philosophers. Hello and welcome to another episode of Might, the official podcast of St. Michael Catholic Church, Gastonia, North Carolina, where we are invested, we are being transformed so we can be fully the Lord Jesus Christ. I am your host, Shane Page, the Director of Evangelization here, and I am joined this week once again with our beloved and suave Father Rossi. (laughs) Father Rossi, it's great to see you. People love your your adjectives. Yeah, you know, I never know where I'm going to go. It just kind of happened. I have to be inspired (laughs) about the adjective here today. Yeah, are you doing okay? (laughs) Yeah, I'm doing great. Great. Loving the fall weather. Yes, it's cool today. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got this weird little. Nobody, I shouldn't really go on to this. Got this little weird elbow thing. Every time I would rest my elbow on the table, it just zings me really hard. So I got to get the doctor to look at that. Oh, okay. isn't that weird? That is weird. Yeah, isn't that just know. leaning into your funny bone? What they say? Well, is it feels like it, but it's worse than that. It's very, really, really sharp. Oh, okay. But otherwise, I'm doing great. It's oh, been wonderful. a great week. I hope you've had a great week. I have. Yeah. The parish is alive, doing Praise very well. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, today uh, the topic is a serious one. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And we're going to get political. Let's, Let's talk about politics. Okay. Everybody, uh, just shut the podcast off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you got a little political on Sunday in your sermon, but uh, did I? Well, just a little bit. Yes, uh, you know, and this is the myth that, that we that want mean? to bust. Yeah, what's that mean? This is yeah. the myth that I want us to bust today, mm-hmm. and it is a myth that goes back to the Enlightenment philosophers, like John Locke of the 15th, 16th centuries. This understanding of well, you know, there's religion over here in this sphere, and then there's politics over here in this sphere, and you should really leave politics out of religion. Mm -hmm. We hear that all the time. We presume that that is the case with Christianity. But what I would argue, and it's not just me, it's informed by tradition and the great writers and theologians of our faith, is that Christianity is not so much a mechanism by which we should understand politics. It is politics. It is its own politics the politics of Jesus, and therefore we can't help as Christians except to get involved in what we would refer to as the political realm. It is political and that the cross of Jesus Christ was in the first century a political instrument. Mm -hmm. Uh, We recite, and I think I've said this before in the the, uh, podcast in the past, we recite the name of a politician every Sunday, Pontius Pilate. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we can't help it. It is political by nature. And so we need to have a conversation about what it means to be a Catholic, what it means to be a Christian when it comes to voting in a democracy, mm-hmm. because we believe that Jesus has something to say about all of these things. Uh, what we want to avoid, and I'll be quiet after this, is that the Catholic Church, especially in Christianity, is against dualism. There is no spirit realm necessarily that should be separate from the fleshly material realm. Jesus, God the Spirit, became incarnate, became flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. Whatever the spirit realm and the material realm were, they have now come together. And then when it comes to our political conversations, we can't separate those two. Jesus entered our real world. He is the Lord of our real world. Governments are a part of our real world. He is Lord, and therefore the church has something to say. Right. That's kind of a long speech. Well, what what also, say you, Father? Well, I think it's probably good, and I, I can't answer this question because I didn't look this up before the podcast, but I think, can you give any kind of a, a brief definition of what politics, what does that mean, that word, where does that root come from? Let me just mean of well, it comes from the word polis from the people, Greek, right? which is people, you have these little city states right. uh, that were in, the, especially in Greece. Um, but it is the, the daily goings on of how we. A society. Yeah, of how yeah. we structure our society. Okay. I mean, that is basically politics. And that when the early Christians went out and the apostles were preaching Jesus is Lord, that was very political. Right. Because the emperors were the ones who sang, I'm the Son of God and I am Lord. And so the Christian movement was considered to be a highly politically seditious movement in the Roman first century, which is one of the reasons why the early Christians were put to death, because they would not worship the, the, the nation state. They would not worship the Roman emperor. What happened was, was some, seen as a divine individual, as, as he was divinely divine, appointed, right? Yes. So I think that's important for our listeners to understand that 
these worldly leaders, these temporal leaders, were seen as divine. Yes. And to walk around following Jesus Christ and saying, Jesus Christ is King and Lord, that's not just a religious statement. So you, well, you just denied your... No, no, the emperor is the all, end all, be all. He's Lord. He's King. Right. He's the God's chosen one, right? Mm, that's if right. If I understand correctly. So the so our listeners, and we what we're saying to our listeners is understanding that, um, you know, what this podcast is really aiming to do is this, this idea that we can live with separate lives. Like I can put politics in this category and then I have my religion in this category, that this is unfounded in the very nature of what Christianity is. And this drives people to, you know, madness and arguments. But the reality is, is as we're saying, is that you can't follow Jesus and not have it affect the polis, the people, the way people organize the society, because Christ himself organized a way of life. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just go to this worship center on Sundays and this is how you're faithful to me. And I mean, our Lord himself, you know, gave commandments to Moses on how to organize society. You know, um, if you're going to follow me and we're going to build a nation, and that was what was, Israel was a nation was with a nation. leaders and there kings. There were of politics involved. Right. Yes. And so... Um, you know that this is uh, this has been the root Christianity, well Judaism too. You know, I mean, it goes back to Judaism and um, and their nation and their leaders, their kings. Uh, many of them, most of them, were actually terrible mm-hmm. uh, leaders. <laughs> to have a good, strong, faithful leader uh, to the God of Israel was rare. Right. Um, but still, the prophets too. You can look at the prophets. The prophets were always entering into the realm of the kings, calling them out for their unfaithfulness to the Lord. But who are they talking to? A king. This was a temporal ruler over space, over a kingdom, over territory. And God even gave Israel the promised land, so they were given land, territory, to establish themselves and organize themselves into a society. So I think if we understand, we got to pull politic, the word politics out of the, the the mudslinging. I guess, yes, keeps that's right. Like, oh, that's such a dirty word. But it's like, well, no, it means people and organizing society. Yes. You know, and so Christians are called to build a society based on the gospel. Yes, because that's where the world is headed. This is why the, the, the fancy word is eschatology. You know, we love that seminary word. You know, the end things, the, the, the end of things. Um, where is the world headed? It's headed towards the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And remember, mm-hmm. as we've talked about in our podcast, the ultimate hope of Christians is not floating away in, into heaven. It is ultimately to, uh, to experience the new heaven and new earth here in this world, the new creation. And so we are summoned as Christian people to prepare the way of the Lord. We want to be a part of helping structure the world such that when the Lord returns and establishes his seat as King of kings and Lord of lords, King of over all other kings, that the world will be ready for that. Uh, and so as Christians, we want, to, we want to promote what will exist in the new creation, in the new world, and we want to stand against what will not exist right. in the new world. So inevitably, we're going to be involved in what we would understand today as politics. Mm-hmm. Now, last thing I'll, uh, I'll say, because maybe you have another comment, and this is a simplification, but I remember doing research on this uh, years ago, that it was John Locke and some of the political philosophers of what we would call the Enlightenment age who came up with this category of religion as we understand it. Because in the ancient world, religion and politics were the same. Remember, you just said the emperors, the Roman emperors, and even other uh, national leaders were considered to be divine. That's a religious implication. So the religious was political because it really did determine how you structured society. Mm-hmm. But in the Enlightenment age, the, the nation state had these pursuits. The kings and the, and the leaders had exploits that they wanted to engage in, and the church just keeps getting in our way. <laughs> How can we get these pesky Christians and the pesky church out of our way so that we can pursue our national goal? I've got an idea. Let's create something called religion, which is a private thing. You know, it's about matters of the soul and the afterlife, whereas politics is really concerned with this world, the real world, and the body. And so you have this understanding informed by the Enlightenment philosophers that there are two different realms. There's this political realm, which is about the body and the matter, and then there's the spirit realm, which is the realm of religion, and never shall the two meet together. You should only talk about the spirit in church, 
but the rest of the time, the politics, uh, the material world belongs to the state and they should have free reign. So with your body, you can serve the state. And even if the state asks you to disobey what the spirit says, you can do that. It doesn't really matter anymore. That's dualism. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's dualism. But the thing is, is that a lot of people really subscribe to this sure. notion. Well, the dualistic notion in general has been centuries uh, afflicting our afflicting us. You yes. Know, that I, that uh, prior to the Enlightenment, you know, the saints would have never um, thought of you know the uh, you know the body and soul as separate right entities. That the human person was body soul together, together. a union. Yeah, and you know, and they were always related. There was never a a, a break in those entities. You know, so yeah, it's something we we, we have struggled with in our minds and understanding our philosophies and theological exhortations uh, as, as it were about that that dualistic we're always having to be careful to fight against that yes i mean in psalm 24 isn't it uh, the earth is the lord's and everything in it yeah and that includes governments and authorities and you have little you know say verses in the new testament where paul says uh, jesus who is lord is above every principality every power and ultimately all the authorities of this world all governments of this world are answerable to him right and then jesus says to pontius pilate right there's you know You'd have no authority if it hadn't been given to you from above. Yes, and he says that my kingdom's not of this world, but that does not mean, well, my kingdom, I only care and concerned about the afterlife and the right. angelic realm. No, my kingdom means my kingdom does not operate, Pilate, on your terms. Right. It's different terms, yeah. and not different realms. The kingdom of Christ is coming upon the world, right? you know, entering into the world we live in. And as we said at the beginning of the podcast, St. Michael you know, our, our, our uh, vision for the parish is be invested, be transformed, be his, that the very nature of Christianity is to tr have transformation, that we are to transform society because the people are being transformed by the gospel. So therefore, society is transformed by the gospel. Yes. Politics, the way you structure society, transformed by, by the gospel. Right. Um, and I think that's a, a key point I'll want to make through the podcast is that, you know, are we guided by the gospel? You know, do we live by the gospel of Jesus Christ? And, and Jesus never in any way in the scriptures indicates that there should be some compartmentalization. You know, he, he wants us to be all in or we're not in. And he never gives us a halfway road, a half point. Um, he, he never does. And that's what always shocks us. Just you look, Jesus says, no, he wants everything. He, he wants, wants it all. Yeah, he wants So there's all never in anything in life where we can and just he, turn off the Christian yeah. light switch. Oh, well, I don't, that doesn't matter yeah. to me anymore. Exactly. No, it matters yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's all comprehensive. Yeah. So which means then, Father, and this will get us into a little bit more of our discussion, when our national leaders are doing things that are compatible with the gospel, we can support that. Sure. But then there are moments where if it's incompatible with the gospel, we have a fundamental obligation to not support that. And so the Bible, there's this interesting tension. On the one hand, you can have Paul saying something like in Romans 13 that we are to be submissive to the authorities of the state. Why? You know, we, we don't want to be insurrectionists, you mm -hmm. know, because that doesn't do anything but uh, promote chaos. So you've got that. And then on the other hand, you've got uh, Shipra and Pua. Are those the two women in the uh, book of Exodus when Pharaoh ordered uh, the women to slaughter the male children? And Shipra and Pua refused to participate. And theirs was the first act of civil disobedience. Okay. So on the one hand, I guess my point is, on the one hand, yes, we are to obey the authorities, as the Bible says in one place. But then when the authorities are doing that which is against the gospel, we are called to a kind of civil disobedience. Sure. And it's in the Bible itself. Those, right. That tension. Does That's that make true. sense? Yeah, the Pharaoh's uh, command to throw all the Hebrew boys over into the river. Yes, right? and, the midwives, and they would not participate. The midwives didn't do that. You know, yeah. So it was civil disobedience. But, you, but isn't that interesting that no, I bet few of our listeners read it that way as, 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 as anything political. But, right. yeah, a, but that was a you can thank the temporal, temporal leader. Yeah. The Pharaoh was a temporal leader of a kingdom. Mm -hmm. He made an edict and said, you must do this. And these women, these midwives did not. Right. Or think of Daniel, who refused to bend the knee, mm -hmm. you know, to the king of Babylon. Yeah. I mean, you just see this. There are things that they can support, but then there are points at which right. we say, nope, we are not crossing this line because of our allegiance, not to you, Pharaoh, right. but to the God of right. Israel. <laughs> because to kneel <clears throat> would have made them God. 
And so it was. Um, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, recognizing someone as a prime minister, or president, world, you know, world leader. You know, that's not unless that world leader says, "I'm God," right? And some of them might think they are, mm-hmm. um, but <clears throat> say, "No, we're not. We can't do that." So um, there's always been that tension in the early Christian, in the early Christian times, with Roman leadership. Because the Roman leadership always wanted well, all them to, leadership really throughout the false the Bible. gods, yeah. right? So to Paul, you know, worship the false gods, um, and the early Christian martyrs just wouldn't do it. Well, let's talk a little. I mean, let's spend a couple of minutes maybe on that point. False gods. We who live in the 21st century, we tend to associate that with with little statues that are worshipped or sacrifices made on some hill or on some altar. We have gods today. Oh yeah, they're just ideologies, right? And they but would, we have to be able to recognize them as that's a false god, and we cannot bend the knee, so to speak, right. to that understanding of reality. Right. We can go on the other side and, and be to give our allegiance to a political party more than we ought to give our allegiance to Christ, the King, and that's important to just make a distinction that um, you know we are defined not by our political party, like you know Catholics. You know, um, and that's probably the tension. We'll probably get into that. The tension is that that, that neither party is fully Catholic. That's you know, right. and the the, the, the struggle um, for Catholics during voting time is really that you know, th- neither one really fits with the faith fully. Right. However, you know that doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Who we vote for and which which uh, political party. Uh, may be putting forth the policies that are more in accord with um, our faith but as we'll see you know that actually both parties um, are clearly very divided Mm -hmm. you know um, and so you know when you want to get into that point about well how do we what do we discern about when we when we vote but um, you know with the idea of the false gods yeah we have to be very careful that we don't idolize political leaders um, or their ideologies or or their their ideologies or you know people being too involved in quote politics you know that that consumes them mm-hmm. and you know as christians we should not be able to you know follow every little piece of political news as christians we ought to be able to be speaking about the good news the gospel we should know the lives of the saints we people should meet catholics and know that they will encounter christ not all the latest political gossip yeah, you know, and even even within the church too, because I say you can still get all. I mean, and, and it doesn't mean, oh, go live under a rock, and and the news of the world doesn't really matter. But um, it is. It's been a very divisive time. Most of the news that we are exposed to is geared towards creating division, anger, and you know, kind of this rebellious spirit and hardness of heart. And so I, you know, I when we meet Christ at the end, He's not going to judge us on how up on the news Mm -hmm. of the world we were he's not going to say well you weren't you know you were kind of you were behind on all the the news of the world and the the economic you know things you know did you know my word did you were you shaped by the scriptures did you let the church form you were you really transformed right by by me you know and i i think we overemphasize well i gotta know everything you know Centuries ago, people knew very little outside of their own little towns and little communities. Yeah, and it's like you know, yeah, it's important to know and pray for the world. But you don't have to know specifically about the world to continue to pray for the world. There's probably violence, violence, wars, corruption galore. So pray for the world, pray for peace, pray for you know. But you can't influence those situations. You have right. an inner circle though of people mm-hmm. you can influence. Mm-hmm. And that's Catholics your family, your yes. spouse, your children. You know, your if you're a teacher in a classroom, your coworkers. Um, yeah, those, that's the area where our realm is, is before us, you know. Well, what I love about the Catholic Church is in the feast days when we have the feast days of certain martyrs, and there's been so many of them who were martyred for political reasons because they refused to pledge allegiance to the, either the king or to the ideology of that state. I'm thinking of the one martyr in particular whose name escapes me, Viva Cristo Rey. Oh, he refused be Miguel Pro. Yeah, he yeah. refused to be, to do do his due deference to the king who asked him to commit a immoral well, that, act. Yeah, and yeah. That, yeah, and that. Well, that. Well, no, that was. Um, was that someone differently? So we'll we'll clear that up. So the Ugandan martyrs, Janu- June third, the Ugandan martyrs were killed for not being uh, for not giving into the king's um, impure desires, mm-hmm. and it was uh, the young men and boys that were uh, I think burned 
alive. Uh, and the catechists, a lot of the lay leaders, protected, tried to protect the boys from, uh, it's, it was King Mwanga, I think was his name. So, but yes, they stood up against the political leader of the time. We're not going to, we won't, you know, do these immoral acts. Mm-hmm. You know, but the Miguel Pro uh, also, though, stood up against um, President Calles um, in Mexico okay. in the early 1900s when they the, that government and President Calles was a Catholic, mm-hmm. yes, I think, if I recall, uh, who absolutely went after the church and, you know, was shooting uh, priests, uh, you know, killing them publicly. And the Cristero movement arose, a rebellion, really, of, of Christians, of Catholics, you know, and um, it was... Uh, to protect their churches, you know, and it was a war, the Cristero War, um, where many martyrs were made uh, from that. Um, but the the laws of the of the government at the time in Mexico were just absolutely um, shut down. Churches, no more public worship. You know, um, just priests couldn't priest religious couldn't be wearing religious garb in public at all, and it was just it was very messy. But that was a that was a standing up for the gospel you know said well they were carrying guns they were involved in the war well they were being attacked you know by the government uh you know when they were this was uh, this was defense they had to defend their churches the priests you know being pulled out of church and shot in front of people Mm -hmm. you know um so anyway um so that was miguel pro and many many other saints at that time uh martyrs i came from that so yeah, those are two, two examples. Yeah, and uh, we, again, it was for political reasons mm-hmm. uh, that they lost their lives. It, it is the nature but of Christianity, but inseparable but yes. from from um, from re- religion. I mean, I guess that's the point: is that it was it was all driven by their faith. Yes, you know. Um, and it wasn't like, well, this is just a political thing. We don't need to be involved. Oh, right. So voting, which is yep. what we should get into, is for the Christian a theological act. How we vote is an expression of what we believe or should believe who Jesus is, mm-hmm. uh, who is our king. Right. You know, and there's, I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a great book. It was written by, I think, Matthew Bates. I read this years ago that he says that the word faith in the first centuries as well, we tend to think of faith as just an inward disposition or an intellectual assent. But faith also meant allegiance or loyalty. And so when the disciples were saying, have faith in Jesus, it wasn't just believe in your heart and make this intellectual consent. It was pledge now your allegiance to the new king and live your life in accordance with him right. and his way. Mm-hmm. So as a result of that, it would also put them in, in harmony in some, in some places of, this, of the nation, but in tension in other places of the, station, uh, of this, of the nation because of their allegiance uh, to Jesus. And there was another point that I wanted to make, but I can't think about it. I, I can't remember what it was right now. Oh, I remember what it was. So I guess a good way to understanding it is that from a scriptural standpoint, governments are goods because God has created them. We can't say, oh, a, a government is just an evil apparatus. Right. They're good, but they're fallen. Mm-hmm. So all political parties, as a result, are fallen. All sure. institutions are falling. Therefore, they need the gospel preached to them because the world is headed towards the lordship of Jesus over all things. And so we want to structure the world, help structure the world in a way that when Jesus returns, the world will, will be ready for his coming. So we collaborate. I think it was the word you used on Sunday. We don't just sit back and relax and let God sort it all out. As Catholics, we believe in cooperation with what God is doing, collaborating in in the world now and getting involved in the world, but getting involved in the world as Catholics, (laughs) as Christian people. Yeah. And just to make a point, so I do have a a small uh, document here called The Challenge of Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. This is a document the bishops put out uh, several years ago. I'm not sure if they've updated or not. This is from 2007. But, um, you know, this is a a point to be made is that the church's obligation to to participate in shaping the moral character of society is a requirement Mm -hmm. of our faith a part of the mission given to us by Jesus Christ. Faith helps us to see more clearly the truth about human life and the dignity that we also understand through human reason. And so as people of both faith and reason, Catholics are called to bring truth to political life and to practice practice Christ's commandments to love one another. So we uh, we have a moral obligation 
uh, to participate in the political That's life. That's a key word. And so we know, can't so opt out. What, what right. do you say I to people thinking, who say, remember, well, I'm just going to opt out. I'm not going to participate yeah. in this. What do you say to people? So that would be, that would be sinful because, um, mm. you know, and you might say, well, what difference does it make? My ballot may be driven into the river. Well, that's irrelevant. You know, if we are allowed and we live in a society where voting still exists and we are called to vote, you know, um, the vote is the public motion of the individual to show alignment with Christ and his church or not in the political sphere. You know, so, um, you know, you might say, well, I'm going to write in. Okay, well, you know, those ideas can be helpful, but in the end, it's like if you if you take the vote and, and don't apply it in any way that's, that's, that's practical, it can, it can lead to a backfiring of where you're only allowing for, if there's two candidates and one is worse than the other and you don't you say, oh, I don't like either one of them. Well, if you don't vote for either one and you just write in, you know, Jesus Christ or something on the ballot, um, well, okay, but you're also not doing anything to prevent the other one from getting, um, you know, the, the, the lesser of the two evils from getting right. a vote, you know, to step forward. I get that. it. And so I think that some of the things that I've tried to help people understand, and this is hard because the political sphere in this country is, is uh, horribly divisive and very messy, but, you know, we've got to stop looking at the person necessarily. Like, well, I like this person. This person's, you know, character is terrible, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But that person could get in office and that person comes with policies. And so you got to look at the not the person, but the policies, which is very hard to do because people, I don't like Democrats. I don't like Republicans. I don't like whatever. Okay. But these people, you know, are the ones that are going to go forward, whether one likes it or not. You know, these are the ones that are going to be given the authority to make and shape laws in our country that we have to live by and that our children have to live by, you know, and as a society will be structured by. And so, um, the, and so to tack on to the other side of that is that Christians, if more Christians got involved in local governmental elections, school board elections, mayor, governor, you know, um, city hall, you know, if Christians, God-fearing people who live by the gospel were more intent on getting into those realms, um, and that's part of really our obligation too is to, in a sense, some people might be called by Christ no, I want you to run for this local office. You know, I want you because this is where it's needed. And so we, um, and, and unfortunately, I think what we've seen really is the Catholic Church. This is, it's a hard time for me as a priest because, you know, you, you have to, it's, I'm fine preaching the truth of what we should do, but it's, it's just, I just know how divided the church is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the bishops seem to be divided, church leaders seem to be divided. Um, misinformation gets thrown around, and it's it sadly is a time when, you know, the Catholic Church should be so unified and be at our best. And I honestly think many times when the voting season passes through, we're not, we never really look so good because so much of um, we can just go right for it is abortion. You know, um, a lot. You know, abortion it, it continues to be um, legalized and uh, put forward because you know the Catholic vote in many places continues to vote for politicians who support abortion you know and people say well it's because they want it to be safe and legal and rare but all of this time none of none of what's happened has made it more you know safer necessarily it's it's horrific what's happening to the child it's murder it destroys uh the woman uh spiritually emotionally psychologically um, you know, and it's not rare. It's never rare. It's never, and, and all those who are promoting it don't, isn't, there's nothing rare about it. It's like, you know, putting in a freeway, but getting off track on that there. But um, oh, we're going to come point, back the point, to Yeah, it. the point being is that, um, you know, the, the Catholic Church is a massive presence in the United States, continually uh, remains to be um, a massive denomination. And the Catholic vote still has probably the greatest, if not one of the greatest influences on an election. It can, sure. You know, and so I think that if we really were unified in what we ought to do as a church, um, we wouldn't be battling abortion on the, on, the, on the level and other things. You know, we wouldn't be battling it the way we would today. 
Well, um, I know my, my, my parents used to raise me to say that local politics really is more consequential than national. We've heard that before. Right. Like, you should really get involved. The local matters. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's far more consequential, and it builds right. up. A couple of things that I found in an article that might be interesting to our listeners, and then you can comment on some of these. Um, the church says first, and I'm quoting directly, that it is always immoral to vote for a person who supports an intrinsically immoral policy. If the reason for the vote is to achieve that policy, so quote, a Catholic cannot vote for a candidate who favors a policy promoting an intrinsically evil act such as abortion, euthanasia, right. assisted suicide, deliberately subjecting workers or the poor to subhuman living conditions, redefining marriage, all in all, racist, if the voter's intent is to support that position. Now, here's, now this is what will lead us to another topic here, because some people misunderstand this point. The bishops, the U.S. bishops, say it could be possible to vote for someone who supports something intrinsically immoral, but only for other morally grave reasons. Pope Benedict XVI, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, described those as proportionate reasons. So uh, Cardinal Ratzinger wrote this, when a Catholic does not share a candidate's stand in favor of abortion or on euthanasia, but votes for that candidate for other reasons, it is considered remote material cooperation, which can be permitted in the presence of proportionate reasons. In other words, the cause that you're supporting, that you believe you need to support, must be proportionate to the cause of abortion, or they right. must be uh, on par in gravity uh, and seriousness, which will lead us to ask the question, can anything be more, could be proportionate to abortion? No, it's not. And I, I think that, that those comments by, that's from the USCCB document. And, uh, and Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Yeah, yeah. so uh, the point being would be, I suppose, that if you had two presidential candidates who both supported abortion and really, you know, we, we can have that. We can have one, one says, I want to put in a freeway, make it safe, legal everywhere all the time, even days after birth. And we have plenty of candidates uh, that are promoting that in our culture. And you have others say, well, I don't like abortion. And, uh, you know, we, I would put a lot of restrictions on abortion. I wouldn't allow it after, you know, five weeks or, you know, um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's horrible. So you don't want to, abortion is abortion. It doesn't matter when it occurs in the life of the child, you're still committing murder. Um, but I suppose in that case, I would interpret that to say you have two, there's no other choice either. Right. So one of these two is going to go into the office open. Mm -hmm. And so in that regard, you um, you have to vote for the one who's bringing the, the, the least or the most amount of restrictions, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know. Then and, it's proportionate. And, and would, and would bring clear restrictions, you know, like parental consent or, you know, um, in tightening, you know, just, I mean, and you don't want, we don't want, you know, we don't want uh, better Planned Parenthood facilities so that they can conduct abortions, we want them to close, right? We don't want any more abortions. So, um, but I think that they, that's the proportion. Now, what also, though, is very clearly the case is there are many candidates out there in different parties that support abortion and others who are totally against abortion completely mm -hmm. and you know and in that regard you can't you cannot vote for morally you know the pro-abortion candidate when the other option is someone who clearly is, a, is, is not to bringing it. in any policies other than to to uh, eliminate it eliminate it right and so like a governor election like we'll just be very clear about North Carolina, you know, um, in that we will elect a new governor in a couple of years. And um, our lieutenant governor, um, uh, Mark Robinson, has been uh, very vocal about his pro-life stance, you know. Um, and it's, it's uh, clear where he is on abortion. He does, he, it's no, you know, on all counts. Right. Then that so point, as Catholics, we would have to say we have a clear moral choice. Yeah, and so there's not, you know, and then likely there'll be another candidate that will be, I mean, and this, this is the issue of this election season. This is an, quote, off season because we're not electing a new president. But, I mean, this is where voters have to be very clear and careful is that, um, you know, uh, this is the fundamental issue that's before us now. It continues to be abortion with Roe v. Wade being overturned. 
Um, and so we say we're not a one-issue church. This is all very true. But pro-abortion candidates um, disqualify themselves in many ways from the Catholic vote if other options are, ag- are alongside of them that are either totally against abortion or, you know, um, have made it clear they're bringing in restrictions. You know, but, but you still have, in that case, people who are that candidates still for abortion, you know, um, which is which is very sad. You don't want any candidate, you know. But I think that's that what has to has to be weighed and discerned and, and, and you know known. We have to learn these candidates' positions, um, and then others say, well, what about you know war? Well, we're going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the the, the U.S. But bishops. I think the point is though, this is where this is where there's all the fighting. It comes right. As a, it does. Nothing is more uh, preeminent of an issue than abortion because it continues to be uh, legalized and promoted and brought in uh, policy by by leaders in our country. And you know that the the unborn have no defense possible. They don't have a voice, literally in the womb to defend themselves. And so the most vulnerable person in any scenario, no one is more vulnerable than the child inside the womb of the mother. So that that's, you know, yes, women are vulnerable. The mother who's afraid and distraught or has been led to this, you know, but she can speak, raise her hand, cry for help. She can look around her and get people to, to you know, support her in this pregnancy. But the baby in the womb has no defense at all. And so that's why we as Christians have a moral obligation to protect the child and the mother, you know, because the mother too becomes uh, damaged, wounded. Um, and of course, there have probably been, uh, there's been probably deaths by uh, abortions, uh, the mother dying Mm -hmm. from the process as well. Yeah, the U.S. bishop said this, that the threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself, because it takes place within the sanctuary of the family, and because of the number of lives destroyed. Now, the article goes on to say that the church does not say that abortion is the only issue. It is the preeminent or foundational consideration about the moral acceptability of a candidate. I guess the, so the church is, it cares about immigration, it cares about health care, it cares about war, it cares about all of the other issues, education. Right. Here's the difference. When it comes to education, health care, immigration, you have to be alive. Right. You have to be alive. Right. And if you are dead, then those are immaterial at this point. We have to at least start, I like the language of foundational. Mm -hmm. You have to be alive to participate. And therefore, if you are going to kill uh, life in the womb, then all bets at that point have to be off. Well, I think what, what, and I mean, I know some listeners probably, you know, maybe be very uh, anxious right now and listening to this uh, podcast or having emotional reactions but the reality, um, what we have to take a deep breath and say is, if I live in a society that will not recognize the child in the womb as a person with just as much rights as any other human person who is visibly outside the womb, then the society is built on a grave moral evil, which feeds into terrible treatment of immigrants to uh, wantonly entering into war and destruction of innocent human life, um, to uh, you know, continue to promote the death penalty you know, uh, on every turn. You know, um, if, if the life in the womb isn't sacred, then, 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 what, Nothing is. then what life is sacred? You know, well, you're the, echoing the elderly, uh, St. John Paul the, II. The elderly in the bed who's, quote, draining the resources of the state is expendable, you know. And then if the baby in the womb is expendable, then all life is expendable. And the, rea- the reality is, is if that's, that is the core, the root, we have to heal it at the root. If we protect the child in the womb and we, uh, we acknowledge as a nation that that is a person, then and that f- child is a person at the moment of conception, then that person has rights. It means all persons have rights from the womb until the tomb, right? Until they, until we die. Then every person in every state of life uh, needs to be protected, cared for, loved. All the laws and policies should be uh, concurrent with their human dignity, which we 
need to protect in law, you know, and there's nothing there from the Supreme Court that has made a de declaration, but uh, some say that that's needed, that the Supreme Court needs to, needs to say the child in the womb, that life begins at conception, and that human person has the right to life, liberty, you know, in the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, so the Constitution is protecting this person, it contacts all persons, right? And the, who's the person Ever, in the womb, in the con uh, um, conception? That's a person. And science has shown all the time that this is true, you know, and the, the mantras of follow the science, you know, it's so clear, you know, that this is a person, you know, and um, it's frightening um, that there are those out there that say a person is someone who can use reason. So, well, uh, you know, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, they correct. don't use reason. So if you're going to apply that, then, you know, what will stop a parent from legally going off and killing their two-year-old? Exactly. You know, I mean, and the point is, is that what, people, what listeners have to understand is if abortion remains legal and if we cannot um, protect the child in the womb, then the, the answer to that question is, Nothing will stop that. That's uh, parent, you know. You're, from, you're echoing Saint Paul yeah. the Second. I mean, uh, John Paul the Second said in one of his encyclicals that the right to health, and he's not talking about theology right. here. The right to health, the right to home, to work, to culture is false. If the right to life, the most basic and fundamental right, is not defended with maximum determination, right? So the church is drawing logical reasoning right. here. Yep. If it's not sacred at the beginning, it's not sacred at any point We're to correct. the end. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's, if listeners remember nothing today, that really has to be remembered. You know, um, it's it's worth even repeating that, you know, if life isn't sacred in the moment it's conceived, then then when is it, it can't be sacred at all? You know, I mean, because you, the person is still a person, you know, and right. you're really just saying that all life isn't really that sacred until somebody comes along and decides it's not, you know, and, um and we as a society have to uh, stand up for the most vulnerable. Um, in, this, in, in this time of election, you know, we've got to, to do our part, you know, locally, uh, because there are, you know, and then if, it's, if you know, people say it's just so, so bad, well then try to run for an, a political office, you know, uh, and pray about that, you know, and get involved locally um, if one can, mm -hmm. you know, and say, well, it'll never happen. Well. We don't know that, you know, and um, if more and more people kept trying, you know, um, and stood out more, stood up more for uh, life publicly, um, you know, voices are voices, and the uh, the leaders follow the the loudest voices. Right. Yeah. So it's about the sanctity of life from the beginning all the way till its end. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a mathematical equation, you know. If you make a if you make an error in the beginning or in any point, everything begins to unravel after oh, that. Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was not there good has, at math, so I there remember was, that. There, there has to be symmetry there. Yeah. And so the church is trying to take a symmetrical response here. And uh, But even then, so that's that's just on the idea of right to life, which we could, we could argue is not theological, but even on the theology, I mean, it's both prongs that the Catholic Church has here. Theologically, God became an embryo. That sanctifies the life of all well, embryonic think, yeah, life. You know, we we have to we have, to, but we don't even need to take that argument to the public square. I'm speaking to the Christians now. Yeah. That why this has to matter. Well, because God has created life. Human life is from God, right? The soul comes from God. So God has willed every person to exist, and so um, He gives clear protection in His divine law and the commandments: "Thou shall not murder." Right. Mm -hmm. That the that human life is is sacred, you know, and it's it's the murder is not, um, it's a commandment. You're right. We cannot. It's it's a grave violation of God's law of love of neighbor to take the life of an innocent person, and and there's nobody more innocent than a child in the womb that has no defense, has done no wrong, has had no choice, you know, um, uh, and this this little point here I'd like to make uh, before I was from this document this summary page I think really kind of sums things up uh, pretty well it's a few it's a it's about two tiny little paragraphs just read them um, there are some things we must never do as individuals or as a society because they're always incompatible with love of God and neighbor these intrinsically evil acts must always be rejected and never supported 
A preeminent example is the intentional taking of human life through abortion. It's always morally wrong to destroy innocent human beings. A legal system that allows the right of life to be violated on the grounds of choice is fundamentally flawed. Similarly, direct threats to the dignity of human life, such as euthanasia, human cloning, destructive research on human embryos are also intrinsically evil and must be opposed. Other assaults on human life and dignity, such as genocide, torture, racism, and the targeting of non-combatants in acts of terror or war can never be justified. Disrespect for human life diminishes respect for all human life. And that, that is our point. But I'm saying that, that's clearly outlined in this summary from the, the, this bishop's document uh, from 2007. So just so I feel like there's a lot of confusion that ensues upon Catholics' minds during election season, mm-hmm. but it, it really it doesn't have to be complicated. It's pretty, right now, it's pretty simple because it's clearly a pro-death uh, culture trying to fight against a pro-life culture. Mm-hmm. You know, the pro-choice culture is evaporating with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And now you have a clarion call, even from President Joe Biden on Tuesday, that he will sign into law first thing, you know, all the pro- all the protections uh, of abortion that were there with Roe v. Wade. You know, so it's very it's openly stated, you know, that um, this is this is the fundamental issue uh, for voters right now, you know, it's always been there, but now with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, you know, the the opposition, um, those who want to promote a culture of death and promote abortion and promote euthanasia and promote all these things that are that are offered, all these horrible sins against humanity offered under the guise of health care and public safety. You know, if the Christian voice, if the Catholic Church, in her voice, does nothing. We are in part responsible. We are, best, right. we are in part responsible for these advancements. People say, "Well, it's, it's, you know." And if if things advance, we know when we stand before God, we say, "But I voted. I did my due diligence. I I tried to bring the policies with the people that were promoting those policies to the fore that would protect life. The most vulnerable being the child in the womb. You know, and say, now whether that happened and." We can't control what happens when we drop the ballot in the ballot box. But, you know, I think, as you said to me before, you know, Jesus stands right there with us at the ballot box. Yes. You know, and it's not just Jesus. It is Jesus. But it's like Jesus is married to the church. He's within Catholics. You know, we are Catholic. We have to allow ourselves to be guided by, yes, the Holy Scriptures, but by the church, by the the bishops, by the teachings, by the magisterium that remain in uh, accord with what we've always learned. Now that means if a one bishop as speaks out and he, you know and says you know um, you you can vote for abortion you know uh, and confuses people you know uh, with that kind of a statement, then no, I mean we we don't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, we just say look, the conscience that I have needs to be formed by Christ and His Church. Um, and that ultimately, um, right now, the greatest issue is abortion. So, no, we're not a one-issue church, but this is the preeminent issue that's causing the most attention, and rightly so, you know. Yeah, and it is, uh, it is a ballot cast in the name of the gospel. So that's why, for a Christian, every ballot we cast is a theological act. And I'm glad you've, you, you've shed some light on the, the seriousness of this and that we can't just sit this out because right. it's always the option. Many people say that it's all corrupt. Therefore, I'm going to opt out of all right. of this. But we can't. Right. I uh, mean, it's not about, I mean, yes, it is corrupt. But, and, you know, is it still going to be corrupt? Uh, yes, it's always because sinners keep getting elected, right? We're all sinners. And, but the point is that if we do absolutely nothing, you know, and there's, there's no, we pro, no obstacle in the way of, the pro-death culture, you know, then it just keeps advancing, you know, and advances all that more when we could have uh, made an impact, right. you know, and we're here, we're at this position, I think, reminding our listeners, we're here because the Catholic Church and or the Catholic vote is so divided. You know, if we, if we had united as a church every election season, we wouldn't be in the predicament we're right. in now. Right. Because, and then we would yeah. be able to get to the other issues that Catholics sure. care about. We care about right. health care, immigration, oh, yeah, and everything yeah. else. But you remember, know, we're yeah. at the starting line well, here and, with abortion. And, this and, is where it begins. I was talking with a priest friend of mine the other day, and he said, really, it, you know, and there's a lot of uh, traction on this th- thought, it's time for a Catholic party. Mm. You know, because ultimately, we are, you know, we also 
with protecting the unborn, you know, we also do care about the environment. We're called to care about the environment. We're, we're called to, you know, it's, it's, it's unlikely to require the death penalty in any modern country today with the resources of prison, you know, that we don't, the abolishment of death penalty is something up for, for debate and discussion because, you know, are we saying we can't protect society in any other way than killing off the right. convict, you know? So we do care about that issue as well. Yes. You know, we want to protect And the church life. has something to say about all of these things. Yeah, and then uh, health care and uh, the poor and, uh, you know, Wages. Uh, violence, a war, you know, um, way too many. We, we don't even in examples. But again. Cultures jumping in, c- countries jumping into war. For resources and money, and you know, in many cases, war is this. Uh, priest friend was saying is it's, it's a racket. Yes, you know, and so and and we have much to say about that too as a Catholic Church. So ultimately, you know, there are um, the platforms of uh, both of the major parties. Um, you know, right now there are pieces, at least in the in the core of what right. the parties would have stood for at one time, that that are Catholic principles. You know, but you know. We really should say, look, the the Catholic Party should uh, maybe have uh, grassroots and begin to grow to say this. You know, ultimately, the whole the whole social issue of the church needs to be represented by the candidates. Right, right. All of those issues matter, but again, to the point of those matters like uh, health care and immigration mm-hmm. and the poor, yeah, that that affects the living. Right. Because it all has to deal <laughs> with human persons. It's, it's, I mean, it's, that's right. the point. It all has to deal with human persons it, and, yeah, and, right. and their dignity. Yes, yes. So there, there's so much here. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Father. I, this sure. is this is a uh, this is a necessary conversation yeah. to have. It's always a sobering one, yep. and you know, it, again, we pray for our country, pray for this election season, and you know, we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to, to continue to guide us. You know, uh, but this is. These congressional elections uh, before us are extremely serious, you know, and even though we're not electing a new president, um, there are people that will be elected that are going to make and shape the laws. And um, as Dr. Ben Carson uh, has said, he wrote a, a letter to all the faith leaders of the country and just kind of you know, saying, look, th- this is about deciding what kind of nation we're going to be in the future. And he's, I, th- I said that was very well said. Um, it's not polemical, and it's just, yeah, are we going to be a, a pro-death nation or a, a nation that decides to rise up and protect the unborn so that we have um, the renewal and the revival of, of protecting the dignity of every human person from conception to natural death in all aspects, which a human person is is um, devalued, denigrated, yeah. And and the world that uh, over which Jesus will be Lord, he's inaugurated that world now mm-hmm. partially. It's going to come in full. And will it be a pro life culture when the Lord returns? Will it be pro life? You bet. Yeah. And therefore, we want our vote to be pointing in that direction. Yeah. When Christ is King yeah. and Lord over yeah. all things. Yeah. And I think that you know, just a closing, people say, "Well, how should I say vote?" the gospel of life, you know, vote Christ and his, and the gospel that he's given us, you know, and, um, and, and he is Lord and that's how you vote. Yeah. He's Lord over everything. Yeah. Yeah, Great. Thank you, Father, for your time. Thank you all for listening. Uh, Please visit our website here at St. Michael Catholic Church. If you'd like more information about our parish at STM ccg.org. Lots of things happening in the parish. We want you to be involved and to see what's going on. But on behalf of Father Rossi, the staff here at St. Michael, I am Shane, your host. Thank you so much for listening and or watching. We'll see you next time. God bless you. God bless.